Namaste. So last time we went over, <laughs> I'm really blissed out today, so don't mind me if I lose it. <laughs> anyway, last time we went over the qualifications for one who is entering on this direct path. <laughs> Just plug right in and bliss right on out. Uh, but then, uh, what about his nature or his character? Uh, Lord Shiva describes, if one is to describe the person who can bring under control his mind, which is restless and turbulent like a whirlwind, and maintain it in a tranquil state, he is verily Brahma, the god that does creation, Shiva, the savior who shows the path to salvation, and Vishnu, the sustainer of the world. He is Indra, king of the devas, and Lord Subramanya, Skanda, the chief commander of all celestial forces. He is Brihaspati, the guru of all devas. He is a supreme yogi and one who has achieved the result of performing all austerities. He is a great scholar who has mastered all the Vedas and Shastras and an outstanding man. He is one who has achieved the true spiritual goal. So <laughs> if one can bring under control this mind, huh? The mind is compared to a whirlwind. What is a whirlwind? A whirlwind is a vortex. There are several videos on our channel about vortex theory. You should read them. I mean, hear them. I mean, look at them. <laughs> you should understand them. <laughs> because the vortex is how this fake creation is created. Huh? Like, how does Brahma do it? He starts with nothing. <laughs> well, he has a little help from Devi. She creates the Mahatattva, which is the sum total of all material elements. So he has the basic building blocks, and he just has to create forms out of it. But then, how is the Mahatattva created? Well, <laughs> it's a vortex, baby. <laughs> I'm telling you, I, I don't know if I can get through this. It's a vortex. Uh, we were talking about ocean waves out in the ocean. And when you're out in the ocean, the waves are coming, and you just kind of bob up and down on the water, and it's no big problem. But when the waves get near the shore, they break. They become a vortex, a circular, uh, actually, uh, movement of energy against itself. See, what happens is the water is flowing this way. Huh? The wave is coming this way. And then it hits the beach, which is an obstruction. And so because of the obstruction, on the bottom, the water turns back. And so it goes under itself and creates this whirlpool action. Whether it's horizontal or vertical, it's the same thing, a vortex. Look at a spiral galaxy. It's a vortex. So is a body. So is even a cell or an atom. An atom is nothing but some electrical charges zipping around at a, some incredibly fast rate. There's something about energy moving in a vortex, in a circle, that creates the illusion of mass. Actually, quantum mechanics tells us the universe is nothing but energy. Well then, why is it so massive? <laughs> because this circular movement on the atomic level, on the cellular level, on the macro level, and even on the cosmic level. Huh? Look at the solar system. The solar system started out as a vortex of dust and gas. And then gradually the planets were created. Each one of those is a little vortex and the same thing. So vortexes are everywhere, literally everywhere. You can't get away from them. And that is how 
matter or the illusion of solidity and mass is created. Nobody knows this. <laughs> Nobody understands this. But Brahma maybe knows. He had to create this universe, so he must know how all the clockwork and mechanics are working. And certainly Devi knows. And definitely Buddha knows, because Buddha talked about it in several sutras. So those who are really able to control the mind are those who can unwind the vortex of thoughts. And what is this vortex of thoughts? Normally, our perceptions are flowing along like a river or like the ocean. Huh? And there may be some waves, but it's no big deal. But then it hits an obstruction, like the wave hitting the beach. And something begins to flow backwards against the natural movement. What is that? The ego. As soon as we create this thought, I, the individual, a separate being, different from the rest of everything. Huh? That's where all the trouble starts. Because <laughs> that leads to us pushing back against the cosmic flow, and a vortex is created, and the next thing you know, you're popping out of the womb in a body, <laughs> all covered with mucus and blood, eh, screaming your head off. Welcome to the material world. So this is how it works, people. And to get out of it, all you have to do is unwind the vortex. So how do you do that? Well, you get rid of this thought, I. It's described, you know, I've been over this a million times on this channel. The Mula Pariyaya Sutta. Go look it up. Mula Pariyaya Sutta is where Buddha describes exactly, precisely, in very scientific terms, how the ego is created. Basically, what, what we do is that we see an object, we perceive something, uh, anything, and then we call it mine. See, really there is no I, <laughs> there is no individual, but we project this label, mine. Huh? This is my eyesight, this is my taste, this is my smell, my hearing, uh, my perception, my object, my chair, my camera, my car, my this, my that. Well, so now there has to be an I for this to be mine, right? <laughs> it's a trick. It's a trick. We say, this is mine, that's mine, the other thing, all these things are mine. So there must be an I, right? No. <laughs> I love that story of Bodhidharma. Bodhidharma came to visit the emperor of China. And of course, he has so many anxieties. And the emperor says, Bodhidharma, this mind is really bugging me, you know. <laughs> it's full of all kinds of thoughts, all the time, day and night, won't let me rest or sleep. What can I do? So he says, come and meet me at four in the morning at the temple. So the king gets it alone. No bodyguards, none, nothing. So uh, emperor is there with Bodhidharma and his big staff, you know? And he says, okay, you find your mind and show it to me and then I'll take care of it with my staff. So the emperor is sitting there, you know, four o'clock in the morning, it's freezing cold up in the mountains, but he's sweating, <laughs> looking for his mind. And he searches and searches and searches, and the, the sun is starting to come up, you know, gradually. And finally, he, he opens his eyes and he says to Bodhidharma, I can't find it. <laughs> There's nothing there. That was his enlightenment. So, same thing, if you do it, uh, go find your mind. Uh, I'll wait. <laughs> find your mind, show it to me. Uh, 
<laughs> Upload a video. <laughs> there ain't nothing there. All there is is thoughts and thoughts and thoughts and thoughts. And all of those thoughts are based on one thought, I. So if you take away that thought, the whole thing collapses. It's so easy. It's so easy, almost nobody can do it. So, what else? <laughs> okay, he's Brahma and Shiva and Vishnu and Indra and Lord Subramanya and Brihaspati and everybody. Huh? He is all these superlative beings combined. Why? Because whoever masters the mind is the master of the creation. Try to understand. The world arises in consciousness. And not that consciousness arises in the world. See, everybody's got that backwards. It's not I think, therefore I am. It's I am, therefore I think. See, Descartes and everybody got it totally backwards. The scientists, the philosophers, the religionists, the theologians, all backwards. Huh? <laughs> they think that they can create the world by thinking. And in a sense, they do. They create their view of the world. But the world arises in consciousness, and the proof of this is trivial. Go to bed and fall asleep. And you start to dream, right? Well, where's the world? Where is your dream, for that matter? In a dream, you have a whole world, a whole environment, of maybe even people and stuff happening and whatever. And you have, you have real feelings about your dreams. If you dream you're being chased by a tiger, you'll feel real fear. But is there really a tiger? Is there really a dream world? And wait a minute, well, what happened to the so-called real world? It disappeared. So is that world really real? <laughs> and then you go into deep sleep, and even the dream worlds disappear. Where are you then? See, there is no mind, there is no soul, there is no ego, there is no individual, there is no self huh, with a small s. There is only the self with a capital S. The one self, Brahman. That's the only thing that really exists. And actually it's not a thing. because it is what we are. And when we identify with Brahman, then we lose our perception of the world because we're no longer creating consciousness, awareness with an object. We are in pure subjective awareness alone. That's Brahman, that's Shivam, the state of Shiva. Shivam means no perception. We don't know whether we're conscious or not conscious. That uh, doesn't matter anymore. It's beyond consciousness and unconsciousness. It's beyond knowledge and ignorance. It's beyond uh, waking and sleeping and dreaming and all of that. Huh? Beyond the beyond. Gate, gate, paragate, parisam gate, swaha, bodhiswaha. Huh? Swaha is a name of the goddess, a very important name. When we put the oblations of ghee into the sacred fire, we chant her name, Swaha. See, all these things are connected. <laughs> There's no difference really in the ultimate essence between Buddhism and Hinduism and thisism and thatism. <laughs> There is no ignorance, there is no enlightenment, there is no path, there is no Buddha. 
See, there is only the great void, Brahman. And it seems like a void because there's no objects in it. But there's, it's not that there's nothing there because there's the subject, uh, the real self with a capital S. Aung Tat Sat. Aung Harihi Aung.